Hi, everyone. My name is Kirk Bachman, and welcome back to The Ultimate Dish. In today's episode, I'm speaking with Rich Rosendale, an award-winning certified master chef and the chief creator of the Rosendale Collective. Chef Rich is a Bucuse d'Or top third finisher and then went on to be one of the coaches for the team that eventually made it to the podium in Lyon, France. He has also won over 20 World Culinary Olympics gold medals and was the youngest member appointed to the American Culinary Federation team. Chef Rich is a classically trained international chef who has cooked in some of the finest kitchens around the globe. As the former youngest executive chef in the history of the infamous Greenbrier Resort, Chef Rich opened five new restaurants and launched a 44-acre Greenbrier farm. Join me today as I chef with Chat Rosendale about his apprenticing for six certified master chefs and becoming one himself, the Bocuse d'Or, and what it means to be a new breed of American chefs. And there he is. I'm exhausted, chef. I'm exhausted <laughs> on the intro. How are uh, you? Yeah, I'm great, Kirk. Thank you. That was very, very nice uh, introduction. <laughs> I appreciate that. No, I, that's that's a, an amazing body of work. Um, we're going to dive into all of that. I'm so appreciative of your time. I know how busy you are. This is going to be fun. Tell me about the set. You are as prepared for a chat as anyone I've ever seen. Well, yeah, we're here uh, at our headquarters here in Leesburg, Virginia. Uh, I have the RC Culinary Lab, which is uh, the headquarters for Rosendale Collective and our offices. Uh, and then we also have uh, Forklift, our events venue here, and we also have Roots. Uh, and I really started um, during the pandemic, uh, we started doing a lot more Zoom calls. So started investing more in better audio, visual and sound panels and all that good stuff like everyone else. Yeah. Yeah. So, so was that serendipitous or did you, did you get into the pandemic and it's like, wow, I need to continue to reach people and we need to do something different. Um, I think I'm always, even when I'm traveling, I always have my head on a swivel and I'm always paying attention to the news cycle, <laughs> things that I see coming. And, you know, I really am not one to stand still. I'm always looking for opportunities and, they're not necessarily always business opportunities. Sometimes they're just ways to make things better for us, for our team, for my family. Um, so that, I think that was part of it. Everybody during the pandemic had to adapt and and evolve. Pivoting was uh, so so important. It's great to see um, so many questions uh, and 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 topics to chat about. Um, my, the first thing that comes to mind, quite honestly, is really around how absolutely busy you are. Great social media presence, consulting work, podcast, Rosendale Collective, Recipe Rehab, uh, Rosendale Online. I'm a subscriber myself, your family, speaking engagements. And we'll get to all of that in a bit. But, you know, the question really is, is how much fun are you having right now? Well, I think, uh, you know, when I left the Greenbrier, I think uh, a lot of people were kind of surprised because, you know, you would look at that as one at one's, you know, the pinnacle of one's career. Sure. Uh, but, you know, ultimately, I wasn't really having fun. And now uh, I'm enjoying what I'm doing. I love creativity. I love innovation. Um, and I like to work with passionate people. And sometimes if you can't find that, there's the opportunity to try to create it yourself. And I feel like that's what we've uh, we've been doing for the last several years. That's brilliant. Great, ad great advice for our listeners, um, many of whom are, are are students. So set the to to set the pace for today. Your intro uh, on Rosendale Online is, and I quote: "You go in depth on why you do things the way you do, not just how you do it." So it's clear that you know branding is powerful. We'll talk about that in a minute. Why is your approach? Uh, in depth, uh, so important is—is is it about protecting the brand, or as a chef, as a certified master chef, is it just the right way to do things? Well, I think that uh, <clears throat> we we always really try to go in deep and kind of explain the why of of what we do, and I think that uh, people. Uh, I think they learn better whenever they're really immersed in what it is that we're we're teaching. Uh, and and also, I kind of go back to our tagline, food, inspiration, adventure. And everything we do is culinary related. Uh, it's got to be inspiring. Uh, and we're always looking for like new adventures. That means in learning, we're always open to new ways to do things. 
And we also, I feel like in teaching, I feel like if I really can connect with somebody and really show them the technique, not just, hey, here, follow this recipe, in a lot of ways, they're inspired and they can walk away feeling like they really understand the subject matter. Um, and that's why we go into such great depth and detail and rely so heavily on recipes and techniques uh, and documenting those because I feel like that's really how you you truly learn. I love that spoken like a like a true teacher. And and I love the the term inspiration versus motivation, right? Two different things, right? right. Inspiration is is not pushing someone up the hill. It's getting them to uh, to join your your cause. I I I, I love that. Let, let's talk a little bit about you in the in the in the early days, right? You're 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 a very distinguished chef and and in and, and person with many accolades and and I've truly have really enjoyed following your career for for many years now, mostly through Chef Ed and and Ron DeSantis, um, who speaks so highly of you and, and both have been on the show, by the way. Uh, you know, having won World Culinary Olympics, being instrumental in the USA success at Bukus du Or, awarded the pres presidential medallion, Chef of the Year. Um, I'd love for you to, that, I, I mean, that's a career for several people, not just one person. I'd love to kind of go back a few years of what your inspiration was to cook, you know, to get behind the stove. Did that come from you know, your upbringing, your family, grandma, was food really important in, in the Rosendale household? Yes. Well, um, first of all, I mean, I, early on, I loved eating. I loved food. I, I had an Italian and uh, German background. So I grew up eating wonderful Italian food. Uh, my wife, who I met in seventh grade, uh, also uh, had Italian roots. So, I mean, I just kind of grew up loving food. I didn't really know. I mean, I was like a lot of kids where I was kind of intimidated about what was I going to do for the rest of my life. I had no idea. Uh, and it wasn't and I wasn't really very good in school. I got into a lot of trouble. I was a real handful for my mom. My dad left <laughs> when we were five years old and they family separated. Uh, our house had burned down on Christmas Day. My mom kind of picked up the family, which was me and my sister, uh, moved us to Uniontown, Pennsylvania. We kind of started over. And I remember the fam, uh, the, a lot of the people in the neighborhood uh, in, uh, from her work where she was a teacher, uh, they donated a car for us to drive and clothes and all those things. And I think that kind of early on kind of instilled like a humble uh, appreciation for, you know, people, what they, what they give you. So I think that and my mom being a great mentor kind of shaped who I was, but really the cooking part was kind of just organic. And I happened to stumble into taking a home economics class. Uh, and I had it, there was an outlet to be creative. I did a cake decorating contest and it, it really kind of maybe was like a, uh, like a spark that made me start to think about, wow, maybe cooking could be uh, a career path. And as we got closer, I got a job working in a restaurant. Um, I had an incredible work ethic. I mean, I was like, whatever I did, I went at it like 110%. And I was very aggressive as a bus boy. I was, you know, really intense as a dishwasher. Uh, and then my mom started taking me to different culinary schools and I ended up going to Westmoreland Community College. But it wasn't like I had this vision for what my career was going to look like. I, I really and I tell I, I tell a lot of kids whenever I go places to speak, because I think that's important for them to hear that I was really probably more like them than they think. You know, a lot of times people think that you, well, that's just, you know, Rosendell and da da da, da he had this all, all vision, this whole vision. And it's really not the case. It's like, you know, you don't know, you don't know if you're going to make a decision that's going to be the wrong one, or you're going to uh, not do well and spend time and energy going down one path and you have to, you know, redirect um, you, you try things and, and you, some people get lucky. I feel like I got very lucky and blessed that this career found me early on. Um, and that's really what has created the biggest opportunity for me is I guess a little bit of luck, um, as, as well. Sure. Sure. Um, I love the humility. I, I kind of want to, you know, stay on that topic for a little bit. You, you mentioned what a, what a force your mom was in your life and, and the work ethic, you already had it. So that was inherent that that's in your DNA. 
I'm curious as I think about students, what dur during those times when you were the best dishwasher and the best, um, you, the best at everything you did or you tried the hardest, what was there someone that was inspiring you or someone you saw? Was it a was it a cook or was it just was it you? Did you set your own path and kind of stay committed to that path or or did you find inspiration from others? Um, well, I mean, I had some great uh, instructors back at Westmoreland. Um, you know, I, I can think about whenever, you know, as far as helping me with that next chapter mm -hmm. in the early years, like really my wife, like, again, I met her in seventh grade. She kept me um, in in line, you know, at that time I was young. And like I said, I got into a lot of trouble. Um, so having somebody like that to kind of help me uh, kind of understand the big picture and family and all that stuff. Uh, and then, my, like I said, my mom very early on. Uh, but when I went to culinary school, uh, you know, like Miss uh, Mary Zapone, uh, who oversaw the program at that time, and, um, you know, Shipley, and um, yeah. it was just there was all these great instructors, you know, I was very fortunate. Uh, and then somebody had mentioned about the Greenbrier uh, apprenticeship program. And most people thought I was nuts. Most of my friends thought I was crazy that I just finished this three year apprenticeship program. And I had my I was doing the last day of my practical and I went over the top with my practical too. I mean, I remember doing like sponge sugar and all kinds of like really, uh, you know, I kind of had that like Excel factor. Like I want to really blow the doors off this thing. And I have always been like that. Like right now, you know um, I could just think of a lot of other things that I'm still trying to apply that to, but I finished that apprenticeship program. I had my truck already packed up. And that night I drove down to West Virginia and started that the next day, another three-year apprenticeship program, which like I said, my friends thought I was out of my mind. Like, why would you want to do this? You just finally finished this apprenticeship program. Why go and do that again? Do you, you, you mentioned kind of the Excel spreadsheet. Do you, do you, do you have this, this chart of milestones? Is it, is it, again, is it, inherent in your dna it's like what what forced you to get in the car and again these are all those lessons the students who sometimes you know they just have they second guess right, right. They, they they don't follow their their instinct sometimes because they don't think they should but it sounds like you did you followed your instinct you checked the box you you, you reached the milestone is that something that can be taught or is that from within? well I think I think early on, um, I was probably motivated by some of the accolades and, oh, you know, sure. graduate top of your class or get a gold medal in this competition. And I think early on, that was a motivating factor. However, um, as I began to see how it shaped my traits and uh, the kind of person I was becoming, I saw the real value was really being more organized and being a better cook and being able to uh, be more productive. These then became the real, like I knew if I took the book, if I did the Boku store, it was going to make me a better chef. Uh, you know, I took the CMC exam and, you know, a lot of times I don't even, I mean, I introduce myself to people and I, I don't even mention it. I, I, I just don't, I don't, I don't let any of those things really kind of define who I am. Um, I mean, I, we use it in marketing and all this stuff and everything, but in, in talking with people, um, you know, I, I don't really bring it up a whole lot, but I, I always look at the, the result of doing a lot of those things has made me a better chef. It's made me more organized. It's, it's made me a better leader. Um, it's made me a better entrepreneur, you know, all these things are kind of the uh, that that those competitions were the catalyst to uh, make a better uh, business person and chef and, you know, family person, you know, whatever, all those things that we all try to aspire to be. Um, you know, I think that's it's like be, it's like having a good uh, physique or being fit. That's the goal. But in order to accomplish that, you've got to focus on the exercise and the push-ups and, and all those things. No, really, really well said. Great advice. Incredible humility. I appreciate that. It's it's about the it's about the process. That's that's it's about the journey. Um, not one 
sort of achievement along the way defines you. See, that that that's just such great advice for students. The the reality is that you've competed in, you know, some of some of the craft's toughest competitions, most taxing competitions. You've earned the title of certified master chef, a, a feat that less than a hundred people in the States have have accomplished. The the Bakus d'Or is one thing, Culinary Olympics another, CMC yet another, and you've accomplished them all. I'd I'd love to kind of just get personal on how some of these 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 milestones um um you, you know impact your life. Why was, for example, um at the risk of getting emotional, I love this stuff. Why why was competing in the Bakusta or and the Culinary Olympics so important to you? Did you already know that that was a stop along the way that you needed to do those things to get to where you're sitting here today? Or, or, or was it just an opportunity that you thought at the time, I can do this, I can do this? Or did you look beyond that? I would definitely say uh, early on in my career, you know, when the accolades and, you know, still building the reputation, um, those things probably meant different things as far as planting the seed. But as I got closer and actually finally doing them, I knew that what that would what those things how they would change me by be by being a Boku store competitor mm -hmm. i i knew that that was going to be the real value and all and you know what i didn't expect and anticipate was through all these things was the relationships that would be built uh the friendships that, that was kind of a uh the ripple effect of doing it but um but early on you know when i first went to the greenbrier I remember my mentor, uh, one of my mentors, uh, Peter Timmons, had mentioned about the Boku store and the greatest chefs in the world compete in this. And one of my, you know, proudest moments of my life, of my career uh, professionally, was being able to bring him in um, with me as one of the coaches, along with Chef Thomas Keller and Danielle Ballou and Grant Ackett's, all walking into the hall where the Boku store was that morning wearing, you know, the team USA jackets. And it was, uh, he had talked to me like as an apprentice about the Boku store. And, you know, he would talk about these chefs and like how incredible that they were. And for me to be able to kind of bring him there as, you know, it was almost kind of like me kind of like paying my respects to him. And it was, it was, a, it was a powerful moment. And I, I could just see in his eye, like, you know, how proud that he was. And, so, you know, these are all things, these are all things that in your life, um, you know, we do them for different reasons, but the reasons change uh, even while the moment is occurring and it's happening right in front of you. And you, you don't always realize why you're doing things. You just have to initially follow your gut. And it's also okay to be wrong. It's okay to, uh, to not, not be success, not to succeed in something, you know, you're not always going to get a gold medal. You're not always going to get on the podium. You're not always, you know, these things aren't always going to turn out the way that you anticipate, but it's the process and the experience that is really what, sh what shapes uh, who you, who you are. In terms of the documentary, we haven't talked about that yet. The contender. Um, and in speaking with Philip Tessier, you know, a few weeks back, a few months back, it it it's so clear when 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 we hear you talk about the competition um in its entirety what people don't see and we really saw that in the documentary what people don't see is the prep and the hours and the travel <laughs> and you, you, your comments about you know staying at thomas keller's father's you know home and so you're away from your family and this is not just a few weeks this is a couple of years of dedicating yourself to this this one day goal, right? And can you speak a little bit about um, both the joy and the and the challenges behind the scenes for those who haven't seen the documentary, the highs and the lows, all outside of just being on the stage that day and the euphoric high that that must be. But oh my gosh, the emotion must just be overwhelming. Um, it is. And I think it it forces you to be disciplined. And I will say probably of all the things 
over the years that all these competitions and things that they've forced me to do is to be really, really disciplined and, and organized. And, and that, that also means like being organized with your time, you know, being able to find time for family and all these different things. But, um, you know, going through that, uh, it is, it's, it's almost like you, you can even watch the movie and it still doesn't really convey <laughs> exactly <laughs> what it's like. I mean, but, and people would be like, why would you want to put yourself through something like that? Um, you know, I honestly, uh, even to, to today, um, I don't even look at like career goals and business goals and life goals. I kind of just, they're all in the same bucket for me. And I really feel like kind of going back even to our tagline, um, the inspiration part is I want to be inspired. Like, mm -hmm. I want to be excited about something we're doing. Um, and that trajectory has really is what fueled the momentum over my life and my career is that, you know, it started with the apprenticeship program and then there's this other apprenticeship program and then there's this competition and then it's, you know, getting married to my wife and having a, our kids and then doing the Olympics and then doing... You know, these, you know, they're milestones, but I don't necessarily look at them as uh, standing um, independently. You know, I kind of look at it as just in life. I really want to just enjoy the ride and the journey. And the way to do that is, you know, I want to have things to look forward to. I mean, last week with my boys on Friday, um, we just we just started doing Taekwondo and I signed up with them and we're a couple months, several months into it. And we just got our orange belt together. And I'll tell you what, I mean, I was like kicking the board uh, over at <laughs> June Lee Taekwondo the other day. Shout out to June Lee Taekwondo. They're amazing. <laughs> um, they but, you know, it's it's um, it's something that kind of fuels me. It keeps me hungry. And I think that the day that I stop being excited and hungry and not looking forward to something, um, you know, I I feel like that's not going to be something that, you know, I, I, I would enjoy. I mean, I want to, I want to enjoy the ride and it doesn't have to, it doesn't have to be all work related. Everybody thinks that that's all that, you know, my whole life has been, but, you know, I've been very disciplined over the years. I mean, my wife and I met in seventh grade and we have three kids. Um, but I think that you've got to figure out a way to align your goals with things that um, inspire you. And that's that's when you find some something really magical happens. I love how you uh, you weave your 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 family into into the conversation, into the equation. It's so thoughtful. Um, I listened to your podcast when you were interviewing Philip, and he mentioned you, you know getting to a place where he was able to shut it off, right? The work, 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 work. But when he came home, he knew that he had to just you know, leave, leave work behind, be there for the family, be there for whatever responsibilities were there. Was that a difficult piece of the equation for you? Oh yeah. And, and, you know, <clears throat> I'm not gonna, you know, sit here and make it sound like it was e an easy thing to do. I'm just saying that's at the end of the day, that's what you have to accomplish. Um, you know, when I was at the Greenbrier and I was going through the Boku store um, I was the last candidate that was also still working a full-time job. And I had a very big job. I was the executive chef and director of food and beverage at the Greenbrier. I mean, I had 18 kitchens and, you know, 200 culinarians. And it was, it was massive. And there were a lot of days that I felt like just pulling my hair out. <laughs> it was just cr crazy. And that's why I tried to remove myself uh, and, and try to structure a plan that could take me out of the frenzy of that busy kitchen. And I was like, well, what a better place to do this than in, a, we just happen to have a nuclear fallout shelter, a bunker be behind a 22 ton blast door. So I went up to the, the cafeteria, which that's, it was the bunkers uh, cafeteria at that time. And that was our practice kitchen. So when I was up there, uh, we had, a, I had an amazing team, uh, Brian Skelding, who there is now the executive chef there. And they were able to take the reins uh, while I was practicing. But it, it was definitely difficult to shift gears and to discipline and say, okay, 
I can't be thinking about this. Now I've got to think about this or whenever I come home, I mean, you know, my wife, you know, we were raising children at that time and, you know, you had to shift those gears, but you know, it's like anything else you, you have to practice at it and you, and, and if you don't do that, the consequences can be, um, impacts on your personal life or your health. You can get fatigued. Um, and that's when I started really exercising and hiring a trainer to help me from, I didn't want my fitness to decline because I thought that could impact my overall performance. Um, and I didn't want any of those roles to, to diminish. I didn't, you know, I had to still keep my job and I had to still give time to the apprentices and my family. Um, so that discipline is really important. I so respect and appreciate the, um, the love you have for the craft. You, you mention your team quite often in your family. Um, can, can you, I'm just going to pick, you know, three incredible names. You, you mentioned Peter already and, and Lawrence McFadden, and of course, Hartman Henke. Um, I know you've worked with many, many certified master chefs, but could you, could you share? And then I'm going to have you kind of talk a little bit about the the importance of the Bacus to Or, but um, can you share just a few thoughts about how important those names are to you and, and to our craft? Right. Well, those are three um, titans. I mean, they are <laughs> just, I'm going to tell you, like working with each one of them, they had, you know, different styles, uh, different things that I picked up from each one of them. Um, but there was without question, there was greatness that you couldn't help by improve and to get better because you knew that, you know, when you're around certain people, their, uh, their presence and their, their, uh, the way that they carry themselves, it brings everybody else up, you know, and, and the ability to mobilize the people around you and to bring the best out in them is really more important than what what you do as an individual. And they had that ability to do with, do that. And, you know, they all, I mean, I remember, you know, with chef Hanky, one of the things I always thought was amazing about him is he, he was really, you know, there's a lot of chefs that had the reputation for this or for that, uh, but working with him side by side, I mean, his, he was just an extraordinary cook. I mean, everything he made was flavorful. He really taught me about seasoning things properly and overcooking things and, you know, he was very disciplined in the kitchen. Uh, Chef McFadden was just like, this guy didn't miss a, a thing. I mean, he could walk into the kitchen. You'd think, you know, heads on a swivel, darts right through the kitchen, making his rounds. And then like later that night he comes back and he'll point something out that you're like, what the heck? You know, it's like a <laughs> piece of fish that was overcooked or whatever. Um, and, and chef Timmons, I mean, you know, he was probably the chef that had really influenced me the most. And, um, the thing I really appreciated about him is he was an extraordinary, uh, teacher and, you know, whether it was somebody that was, um, a, a, a student in our apprenticeship program, or it was another certified master chef, he gave them the same kind of explanation and level of detail, uh, and the man would quote pages out of Escoffier that you'd be like, there's no way that that's what's on page 137. And I mean, it's just <laughs> incredible. And he always knew the stories uh, about why some of the dishes were named what they were, you know, because the cooks at that time, they couldn't read and write and they would name dishes after uh, famous people or famous events, you know, uh, chicken Marengo and Tornado's Rossini, you know, these are, these all had sig significance that he could basically recite uh, the history of like every dish. And it was just remarkable. Just, just fascinating. Thank, thank you for that. Super, super thoughtful. I had the good pleasure of meeting, meeting all of these Titans, as you referred to. I love that. Um, can you, for our listening audience, we've talked a lot about Bukus de Or and the importance, the significance Paul Bukus, can can you share a little bit more why this particular competition is so important? And and not only 2013, you're you're involved, and then you're then you're involved with the USA, you know, finally getting to the podium with 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 Matthew and with 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 Philip. Why why is this particular and and of course Thomas Keller and 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 Daniel and so many others that are involved today? Um, why is this such an important 
competition in the world? Well, I think, um, you know, the, the thing that's really special about it is that you're, you're representing, you know, your country. So it really kind of is a very proud moment and it's an honor to be able to go and to compete. Uh, and you're also, it's, it's, it's an opportunity to kind of get everybody in the United States behind um, an initiative and to root for, you know, it's almost like the Olympics, you know, watching, you know, snowboarding or ice skating and, you know, I used to play ice hockey. So I remember the miracle on ice was kind of a really cool uh, story. So I, I felt like whenever we were competing that I felt like, you know, people were setting up TVs in their kitchens and watching. And it, it was really, it was cool to be part of. And it also puts perspective that, you know, you're really just part of this process. There's an entire team and uh, people that are behind you and a lot of resources. Um, so it's a very exciting thing to be part of. And we, you know, I was the last chef again, you know, working at the Green Prior at that time is one of the things I recommended. I was like, listen, I think if we really want to win this thing, um, the candidate has to be doing just practice for the competition. You can't have a job and we've got to figure out a way to do this. And they did do that. And Phil was able to dedicate 100% of his time. But that doesn't mean that you're going to go there and win. You still have to be sure. really creative. Yeah. And um, so it, it's uh it was just an, an incredible experience. And, you know, it's just you and your, your teammate, you know, Corey Siegel, who was uh, my co me uh, um, at the time were competing in this and it, it's in, it is intense. I mean, the being there that day, I mean, having all these cameras and people ye yelling and music playing, I mean, but I, I always felt like I always had the ability to just like, I could just shut it off like it was a light switch. And whether I was in a soccer stadium uh, or Thanksgiving dinner at home, I'm able to focus um, on what I need to focus on. And I think the culinary competitions over the years have helped me um, to be able to, to do that. In terms of um, just playing and organizing, again, for the audience, this takes place every two years, right? But that's right. Like the United States has already they they're already four years out right getting getting people prepared uh for the for That's this right. competition right what's the significance of this just popped into my head because you know following this for so many years what what is it about the scandinavian countries in recent years that has elevated them to the top of of of, of culinary competitions um my theory is the uh the culture of young cooks growing up there, um, they they don't necessarily have, um, you know, st structure and tradition is good, but it could be a double-edged sword. So if you're growing up in France and you're going to school and somebody says, this is the way you make puff pastry, that is the only way that you make puff pastry. Mm -hmm. And you, you don't deviate from that. And uh, where in the Nordic countries, there was an element of, um, I guess, kind of you could uh, of exploration where you could do things that weren't really necessarily going to kind of put you in this sandbox where you, you know, you have to make puff pastry like this. And, you know, you're not necessarily making puff pastry for the Boku's door, but it's that 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 level of thinking where the French were extraordinary at execution uh, and, but I felt like a lot of the Nordic countries would be, bring an element of, uh, different ideas and they would couple that with, they had amazing, though it was a small sh support structure, uh, the country and all of the past chefs really kind of got behind the candidates and they stayed involved. And finally the United States did that thanks to, uh, the mentor BKB foundation. Uh, I mean, they, you know, I'm still involved in, Gavin has stayed involved. Gavin was a big part of uh, getting that, you know, kind of connecting the dots with Thomas and sure. Danielle and Jerome yeah. and all them. Um, but, you know, the United States now is considered, a, a you know, a, a, a real threat uh, to win the competition now, whereas for years that wasn't the case, you know. Um, but it, it has a lot to do with that. I think that culture of how you're you think about uh culinary competition. Um, and I think the Nordic countries just, they 
had great resources, but it was also their, their mindset, you know, just very creative doing things outside of the box and just very good cooks. Great, great insight. When, when it comes to Bocusta or um, attempting or, or, or going down that path of certified master chef or even the culinary Olympics or any competition, ACF competitions around the country, is there any subtle advice that you might give to, to young culinarians who are listening to this podcast or Googling things and, and, and thinking about, wow, I wonder if I could do that. What, what would be the most subtle advice that you would give the easiest thing to do first? Um, well, I, th I think, you know, going and doing culinary competitions to make sure, uh, that that's something that you like. Um, and, you know, for me, I, I, I really kind of just followed what I enjoyed doing, like what I wanted to do. And I think that sometimes people where people may go wrong is they may, they may start with oh, I want to look like that, or, oh, I want to be um, a, um, you know, celebrity chef. And, you know, that that's not really where you start. You know, I, you don't start off as saying like, I want to be, um, you know, the Boku store candidate. I mean, that that can kind of be a milestone, but it's really important to recognize um, the, the process that is in front of you and that you've got to be willing to put the time in, uh, in order to, to, to be great at, at that. Um, you know, and sometimes people get lucky, you know, maybe if you want to be a social media influencer, uh, you could just post some viral video and success may run out from under you, but that's not, I wouldn't count on that. You know, I would count sure. on doing the push ups and start off doing the competitions and, and like I said, just make sure it's something that you really like doing, because if you don't enjoy doing it, then finally, when you get to the top, you're still not going to be happy. I don't care how much money anybody pays you. Um, I, I mean, I, I don't do what I do because like I, you know, m to make more money, I, you know, making money is part of the process that gives us the means to be able to do the things we want to do. But, you know, we want to have fun. We want to enjoy what we do. And, you know, we want to attract people that are also um, want to be inspired because that is a contagious, uh, positive thing to have in your organization. Now, yeah, well said, well said. I'd like to go kind of back to the Greenbrier just a little bit because such a, even when you speak, you speak with such reverence, such a, such a great, you know, part of your life, huge property, right? 11, thousand acres, over 700 rooms, 20 restaurants or so, um, outdoor, indoor venues, shops, beautiful. When, when you've kind of talked about that opportunity coming to you, but when you think about the, the Greenbrier and what that meant to your career and how it sort of created a, um, a platform for you, you know, what comes to mind? What, what is the, what was the process like and what was the most important, um, I guess what you're most proud of, uh, what legacy you left at the Greenbrier for future chefs and future guests. Well, I think that uh, what I remember about the Greenbrier probably the most are uh, the 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 teachers and the people, and I kind of think of them as teachers. But you know, I mean, I just remember like making soup with like Pete Alderman, and I remember the guy, mm -hmm. you know, like shaking out these Brunois vegetables that we had for consomme garnish like in the green briar made consomme every day um and you know i remember just like you know i'm batting it out and you know i'm getting ready to throw this you know strainer away in over in the dish pit and you know it was like five little pieces of brunoise carrot left in there he goes hey hey what are you doing and maybe like pull them out i had to make sure it was like come, all of the vegetables are up so it was like little things like that that like stick with you. And the, you know, there were so many people at all levels of, of that uh, organization that you learned from. And it was even the people that were, you know, Johnny Campbell, you know, setting up a party and showing you how to do it efficiently and, and how to break things down quickly. And I mean, that place was like, you know, I feel like I came out of there and it was like Navy SEAL training for chefs. I mean, I felt like I, <laughs> I could throw them into anything and I was like ready for it. Um, so the the, the mentors uh, at all levels, not just like the Peter Timmons of the world, but it's also the people that you learn to butcher from and make pies. And, and then I'd say from an education standpoint, 
is that because I was able to do so much repetition, like, I mean, if I was breaking down Dover soul, I mean, I had a pile of Dover soul that I had to break down. So I got so much practice that was different than like what I got maybe when I was going through my first apprenticeship in culinary school. It was a great education, but that repetition uh, and then also just because there were so many different things going on. I mean, I could be doing a gold service dinner and then making sauces. I mean, I remember making sauces there as a senior apprentice. And I remember one one day I had over like 55 sauces to make uh, just, you know, by four o'clock. You know, it was like and one of them was like burn ace for like 600 people in a mixer. I mean, it was just it was just, it was absolutely incredible. I mean, it was just like, you know, something that was out of like this movie, you know, like uh, imaginary place, you know, uh, such great, great memories. I can't wait for the book to come out and I yeah. imagine you're thinking about it. I imagine you're thinking about it. Yeah. Well, let, there'd let... be a lot, a lot to say about <laughs> the Greenbrier, but all, all amazing things. Oh, that's just great. Let, let's talk about the brand. Let's talk about the Rosendale brand a little bit. You, you've already done so much, but it kind of feels just chatting with you, like you're just getting started. Can can we talk a little bit about the Rosendale Collective? Is is that where it all starts, and 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 all of the other focus goes in? Uh, innovative company, inspiring the culinary world. Um, what's what's the what's the elevator speech? What's the the mission statement? Well, I I knew that when I left the Greenbrier that I I didn't want to like go open a up a, a restaurant. Um, I wanted something that was more robust, something that was a company that could have a collection or a repertoire of services and businesses that are essentially under our umbrella. Um, so basically, if you go to Rosendell Collective, you can see kind of a lot of the different facets of, of what we do. We have Route 657 Restaurant. Um, that is in Leesburg, Virginia. We have Forklift, our events center. Um, it is in a warehouse. We do a lot of our cooking classes in there. We have the RC Culinary Lab, which is a USDA facility. And we do a lot of our R&D and consulting out of there. That's essentially like our, our headquarters. Uh, we have Rosendell Events uh, in Atlanta. It's at 200 Peachtree. Uh, we do all with the exclusive caterer for 110,000 square foot of event space. Uh, this Friday, we're launching um, a, a, a new concept there that will be at the uh, Harry Potter exhibit for the next uh, six months. Um, we have uh, a lot of different consulting um, projects that we do. Uh, we have about 12 culinary instructors that are certified to teach various topics of um RC curriculum, our Rosendale Collective curriculum. And these chefs go all over the country doing various trainings, private training for, for various um, companies. Um, we also did a partnership with the Residence Club at Ocean Reef, Florida, um, and launched the food and beverage program there. Um, we have Rosendale Online, uh, which is our online recipe subscription platform. I mean, I know there's a, you know, we do a lot of different things. Um, we, we actually, we also just launched the uh, Rich's Backyard, uh, our premium spice blends. We have that available on Amazon, but, you know, in all these cases, uh, it all kind of, everything kind of starts like, you know, one thing at a time. Like, I mean, I, I didn't come in, I didn't leave the Greenbrier and then just add all this stuff. You know, we started with Rosendale Collective and by the way, it was just me. And I was, sure. you know, started doing my own consulting. I was in Dubai doing projects. I was, you know, started doing the show Recipe Rehab. Uh, and then when I moved the operation to Virginia, uh, a little close, we're in the DC Metro, very close to Dulles Airport. Um, that's when things really started to, um, to accelerate. Um, and we, I mean, it's amazing the stuff that, I mean, I, I can't even tell you, I mean, it's almost like when I was in culinary school, if you could tell me like, Hey, this is what you're going to be doing and how you're going to be doing it. I mean, it's just really been amazing. It's been like, whatever, you know, we, we think about things and we, we do them, you know? Um, and there is, believe it or not, there's a lot in, in order for us, for the systems of what we do to work and to make sense, there is a lot of cross pollinization of resources. So, Rosendell online. It's like, wow, how do these guys have time to come up with content and do all this stuff? 
Well, if we're doing an event, uh, an event out at the uh, Allegiant Stadium for the Raiders, uh, we'll pull like four of those dishes off and th- that'll be content that we've done that we've used somewhere and we'll put that on the platform. Um, we have an event coming up with Ferrari and we'll take maybe two of those dishes and maybe we'll say, hey, we're going to use this in our next class. So we we do a lot of um, a lot of overlapping to try to connect the dots. And by the way, that helps us uh, get better and fine tune a lot of the things that we're we're doing. We created a Rosendell Collective task force that people can apply for uh, and be part of our task force. And um, they, as being part of the task force, you can go to different events all over the United States. Um, we have we we have uh, openings with our culinary instructors. Um, we have very attractive compensation for them and they get to travel and, and they train with us to learn the curriculum and then they can go and do the courses themselves. So a lot of this has just been kind of like building blocks that we've kind of just been stacking and stacking, but they are really kind of interconnected in, in a lot of different ways. No, I appreciate that. And con- congratulations, unbelievable success. And again, you're just, you're just getting started. I, I was at a, at an event in New York City um, a few years ago, and Daniel Ballou and Eric Repair were up on the stage, and they're really good together. And someone raised yeah. their hand and said, "Hey, chefs, when um, when you're not in the kitchen, who's cooking?" And they both kind of chuckled and looked at each other. And Repair kind of responded by, "Oh, it's the same people in the kitchen when I am in the restaurant uh, yeah. are doing the cooking." Right. So yeah, so you know that's a lot. I mean, and 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 it's your brand, right? It's your name. And you can't be everywhere, right? How important is the team, your team? Oh, I, I did a post the other day um, highlighting how important um, our team is. And, um, you know, the doing things that are going to inspire people and being able to attract more of those people. I mean, that that really is the golden goose. Uh, and mm-hmm. you you have to be able to attract the the right people and to keep them and to keep people inspired. I mean, I really believe that we've been able to do what we do is because we we've attracted the right people, really just great people. Um, Christopher Ryloff, who's our corporate chef based in uh, Miami, um, he came to one of the classes at, you know, years ago. Um, just as a participant, you know, whenever I was just doing classes, when I first left the Greenbrier and he was like, Hey chef, this, this has been a really inspiring experience. And do you mind if I ever come and help you out with a couple of classes? So he started doing that. He came to a couple of classes and then I offered him a job and then that job turned into, you know, a uh, hourly to a salary and then kind of kept moving him up. And now he's corporate chef and he oversees like all of our, uh, content for the online platform. He handles all of our uh, training remotely around the United States. Uh, he is at a lot of the events as the lead chef for a lot of those. So, you know, what we've done has kind of made, uh, we've made each other better. Uh, and we've been bringing other people into the organization. I mean, you know, we have uh, Scott Poff now. I mean, I'd, I'd say, you know, talking about the Greenbrier, I mean, I have two people that are working with me that are I was working with at the Greenbrier. You know, one of them was a classmate of mine, um, Scott Poff, who's our director of culinary for the Roots Brands. And he uh, oversees all of that. But he and I were classmates in the apprenticeship program. Um, and I know he's battle tested. Like there's nothing you can <laughs> throw at him that that guy isn't going to be able to handle. Uh, Andrea Griffith is the executive chef um, at the Residence Club in Florida. Uh, and she's also uh, on our task force and she's also one of our instructors. So these are, you know, having the right people and people that you can trust, but also people that are going to be excited about what you're doing. Um, that's, that keeps, that keeps me going too. That keeps me excited. Yeah. Well said, well said chef magazine has referred to you as a new breed of American chefs, this combination of different generations and philosophies from within the industry. Um, what's that mean to you? What, what is a new breed of American chefs? Um, I think that, you know, really as when I was a, an apprentice and when I look back to a lot of my mentors, they grew up in kitchens that 
were very structured and it was like, here's the way that you do things. I guess kind of pointing back to that European um, uh, kind of model in the kitchen, the hierarchy and all of that stuff, the way that things worked in Escoffier and all that. And I think, you know, I was really kind of at that uh, turning point, uh, tipping point, if you will, where I was, you know, I was one of the first chefs, you know, really doing sous vide in the United States at the tavern room years ago, like, like pre-internet practically. And, uh, you <laughs> you're know, not that, that was, old, <laughs> right? You're not well, <laughs> well, but I mean, before people really started using sure, the sure. internet, I mean, yeah. people were not, you could, I remember even going to Google which I really didn't use very much and searching sous vide. And there was nothing, yeah. there was nothing on it. And, you know, the, the thing is, is I think really kind of going to like Peter Timmons and say, Hey, do you want to taste these short ribs? And they've been floating around in a water bath for two days. <laughs> and he's looking at me like, what the hell is wrong with you? Um, and I, I think kind of just being open-minded to a lot of these different um, ideas. And by the way, some of the ideas and some of the things are not going to be, you know, good they're not good ideas but i think being open to uh trying a lot of those and merging a lot of those um and i know when i went and took the cmc exam i probably did a lot of things that i probably shouldn't have done you know i mean i just the i was probably overly ambitious with some of the menus and stuff like that and and sometimes it showed in the score you know i didn't go up there and get a perfect score every time you know but i think you got to be willing to try different things and be willing to make mistakes you know even at this level um you have to be willing to still make mistakes and that's how you get better as long as you take corrective actions and um you know get better you don't score unless you shoot. I love, I love that. That's right. I love that. It, it reminded me as you were talking about that, you know, you know, taking the test. Ed used to always say that um, you don't show up, you know, to take the certified master chef exam to learn something. <laughs> you, right. You show up to cook and, and, oh, yeah. and sometimes you take risks, right? Yeah. So um, I was going to ask, you know, in your Ted talk, I thought this was fascinating. You, you talk about running out of runway. And by the way, just a precious TED Talk, really. The the, the point that, and, and I've mentioned this to you, that when you brought up the little bench that you made when you were a little boy and then how your boys, who are getting older now, but how they used to use that bench, um, just a perfect analogy to really kind of, you know, sort of settle the crowd, right? Listen, I'm, I'm up here and I'm going to talk to you as human beings and I'm going to be really... Uh, emotional and, and transparent. And so, so kudos on that C captured my attention immediately, but you talk about running out of runway and you talk about prioritizing how important it is to prioritize things, ventures, projects, people that are important to you. How's your runway today? Well, I feel like, um, I've been able to do a lot of the things that I've wanted to do. I mean, the one thing like my wife would tell you is like, I feel like I, I, I'm not, I don't, I'm going to leave everything on, on the table. I don't have anything that, that I'm looking back and say, man, I probably should have done this. I probably have done, you know, more things than I probably should have done. But I, I think it's an important analogy because I guess I want to always kind of echo to uh, other people to say, listen, you know, what are you waiting for? Uh, because, you know, people talk about like, I want to do this or I want to do that. And I think the first time I even said that and, you know, somebody else brought it up to me, it's like, wow, that was a really, uh, I haven't heard that before, but I was talking to an apprentice who was talking about, you know, all these different job things that he wanted to do and stuff like this. I was like, I was like, well, chef, what are you waiting for? You're running out of runway, you know? And because, you know, you could, you could talk about doing things and before, you know, like five years goes by and, um, you know, you, you think like, well, I'll do this again, you know, in a couple of years. And, you know, you got to really strike while the pan is hot because it, you know, it, it just may not get hot again. And you, you got to keep the momentum uh, and really seize the time and the opportunity uh, because life goes by really fast. And by the way, I mean that with like spending time with your kids, if you have kids and that's, and that's important. 
uh, or, you know, your, your mom or your dad, you know, whatever, whatever it is, you know, whatever it is, it's just sometimes people tend to procrastinate. And uh, that's a, one thing Peter Timmons always to say is procrastination is the thief of time. And before you know it, you know, time is like a dollar bill. And every day, think about the equity of time and where and how you're spending it. And if there's anything that I feel like I point to that I've done well, believe it or not, I wouldn't say cooking or competitions. I would say probably managing my time and being able to give enough to these different things and all these different people that it, it, it that I've still blessed to have many of these people still around me. Um, I think that is really where you want to center your attention is, you know, how you spend your time and just think of it as very precious and that you, you really, uh, you can run out of it and, and you don't know when. So if there's a goal that's in front of you, um, go after it and and don't be, don't worry about waiting until the conditions are optimal for flight, you know, just yeah, go yeah. after it. Go for it. Yeah. Uh, my 12 year old, <laughs> I guess this, it's the tagline of the, of, of the century, right? Tom, um, Tom Brady, let's go, right? Everything's let's yeah. go, let's go. You know, I love that quote by Peter um, reminded me, I, I've got a journal that I've had for years and Peter signed it, I, 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 you know, years and years ago. Um, I'm going to pull that journal out and add this. If you're okay with that, I'm going to add that quote to it. I think yeah, it's yeah. absolutely beautiful. Um, gosh, I, I, I have so many questions. I think we're going to have to do a part two because, <laughs> uh, but, um, you know, two quick things, Chef. When, when you, building a brand is so important and it's clear that you're you're being very thoughtful as you as as you do this. Um, are there some critical em elements? I'm a big fan of stack rankings, right? Like if we had more time, I'd ask you top three bands of all time, right? Go. Yeah. Um, but if, if there's a podium for critical elements that entrepreneurs should 100% consider when trying to build their brand and any insight there, um, what, what not to do or what to do, right? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, probably the the number one thing I would say is really kind of find uh, your voice. And mm -hmm. that means to really think about what is it that you want to say? What do you want your brand to say? And um, really, that will that is going to um, to dictate what everything else looks like, you know, what does your logo look like? What does the font look like? What do the pictures feel like? You know, are you uh, somebody, and by the way, you know, a brand doesn't mean you have to go out and launch a business. You know, your, your brand is your reputation. You know, you don't even have to have, you don't have to have a logo, you know, don't, that would be the other things is like, don't start with a logo. Don't start with, you know, a website. That's not a, that's not a brand you know, uh, you got to think about like what your voice is, like, what are you, what are you trying to say? You know, what is your brand trying to say? You know, is it, uh, is it a non, not for profit, um, you know, community garden. And this is, this is the mission. This is what we're, we want to accomplish. Cause that's a brand and, and all of your marketing collateral, all of your messaging, um, the way your team dresses, the way, uh, and by the way, that could be very casual. You know, it, it does. It just means that the voice and what it is that you or your initiative, your company, what have you, your brand wants to say, it really kind of informs what everything else looks like and feels like. But when people say, you know, they're, hey, I'm launching a website and I got a my logo and I'm like, you know, well, for, for what? You know, what it, what is it that you're trying to say? I mean, you could just you know, have a web. I mean, I think having a website's great. Um, I think, uh, you know, whatever it doesn't, it could be a person, it could be a thing, a product, you know, whatever. Uh, but I think that's the, that's the big thing is like, what is the mission? And, it, and if you want to be like the best executive chef or the, or the, the premier 
caterer in Los Angeles um, or Philadelphia or Pittsburgh, wherever, um, that's fine. You you can all these things are the the voice like you know but but when you say that it's like hey i want to be an ex you know the most sought after caterer um you know all of your pictures and the colors and every there should be some continuity with oh i know i know what i'm gonna get with this person you know um whether that's somebody coming in for a job interview because you know you're you people are brands you know you look at so now you can go on facebook and you can get a lot of information about somebody before they ever hit the first interview, you know? Oh, sure. Um, yeah. 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 <clears throat> Very good. Very good. I got another, another great quote there. Find your voice. Brilliant. Brilliant. Chef, the name of the podcast is the ultimate dish. So my final question is in all your travels and all your experience, what is the ultimate dish? Oh man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I've had so many like amazing I've had so many amazing meals. Um, I, uh, I, uh, have eaten Michelin star restaurants and Boku's door. Uh, you know, whenever I was doing the Boku's door, I, uh, all of these chefs were so generous that whenever Corey and I would go to a different city anywhere in the world, as part of our training, uh, they people would do these incredible meals for us. And we were like, Oh my God, it's like, we're, we, we, <laughs> one, one that's kind of funny is we were, um, we went and ate at, uh, Paul Bocuse's restaurant. And, uh, that was like on a Friday and we were like food fatigue. Like we ate so much food. <laughs> and then the very next day we didn't know, but Jerome was flying in his son, Jerome Bocuse. And he goes, Hey guys, tonight I'm taking you to uh, my dad's restaurant. We're going to, we were like, Oh my God. So it's like two nights in a row um, e eating there. So that was kind of a funny one, but what I, I point to all of these amazing meals and everything I've had, like, you know, just the French laundry, Alinea, my family, wonderful meals. But when I was on my first apprenticeship, um, I went to Italy and um, I, had a pasta dish there and it was like the first time I really had extraordinary pasta and it was just simple. It was like pasta, some greens and these mushrooms and a little bit of cheese on it. And I can still remember it was like, I was like, Oh, okay. This, That's this, it. <laughs> this is great. Food. I, now I understand. And it, it was, it was such a, on the opposite side of the spectrum from all the culinary competitions and like what I thought you had to do to make food great. And then I go to this like little restaurant, like in the afternoon and, you know, have like a glass of wine and, you know, four ingredients in a bowl. And I'm like, Whoa, man. And so that was to me, probably one of the most memorable bites. Cause it was also, I haven't, I didn't have great food, uh, at, at that stage really. I mean, I've ate at lots of good restaurants and stuff like that, but you know, I had not experienced the, the French laundries of the world. It was really just traveling internationally, going to Italy and having just some basic bowl of pasta, but it was amazing. No, I love that. Um, you know, oftentimes the ultimate dish is, is just the beautiful memory of, of an experience, um, whether with your family or by yourself. Um, I love that. That kind of reminds me of ratatouille right when he when he sits down and it takes it back to his childhood that's yeah. what that's what food should do right transport us well you know on that same trip uh i was with uh some of the, my my friends and we all happened to have football jerseys on and we were in pescara on the coast of the adriatic sea and we were sitting in a little restaurant and we were getting ready to order and then the server comes over and brings this big platter of seafood down and i look over i'm like did you order this and no one had ordered anything. And here was the table next to us of just some some local people that thought we were American football players and <laughs> sent us a bunch of seafood. So we were like, oh, thank you. Yeah. So I, maybe they thought I was the kicker or something. I don't know. Yeah. I'm not, don't look like a football player. But uh, but yeah, those memories are as important as, you know, the actual food itself is really um, the, the incredible moments. Just love that. Chef, thank you so much for spending time with us today. Just absolutely fascinating. I, I wish you all the luck in the world, and I hope we can chat again. Absolutely. My pleasure, Kirk. Thanks for having me on the show. 
Thank you for listening to the Ultimate Dish Podcast brought to you by Auguste Escoffier School of Culinary Arts. Visit escoffier.edu forward slash podcast, where you'll find any materials mentioned during the podcast, including notes, links, and other resources. You can also browse other episodes and subscribe.